Good afternoon and welcome to our next installment in a lecture series, Democracy in Peril. First, I would like to apologize that for reasons beyond my control, I could not be with you in person today. Considering your efforts to attend today's lecture, I have pre-recorded this lecture to allow you to imagine that I'm here with you in spirit, if not in body. Today's lecture consolidates prior lectures with the understanding that not only has democracy around the world come under challenge from populists or worse, but more so it resulted in a comprehensive shakeup of what we used to accept as the world order. We now enter an era of great power competition and that of the rise of the middle powers in the world's struggles to combat global challenges such as climate change, food insecurity, massive human displacement, and regional conflicts. This is the focus of today's lecture, so let's begin. The international law defines this phase in global affairs as a multipolar world, a transformation in the global system. After more than three decades of American efforts to establish and consolidate a unipolar international order, we are witnessing signs of the deterioration of the American-centric international order and the formation of a new international order. Evidence, facts, and developments in global arena confirm that the conflict between the United States and the European Union countries on the one hand, and both China and Russia on the other hand, revolves around something that no longer exists, which is the world order that Washington wants to strengthen and Beijing and Moscow are working to change it. In other words, what we are witnessing is what's been called great power competition and the formation of a new world order. The term new world order refers to a new period of history evidencing dramatic change in world political thought and the balance of power in international relations. Despite varied interpretations of this term, it is primarily associated with the ideological notion of world governance, only in the sense of new collective efforts to identify, understand, or address global problems that go beyond the capacity of individual states, nation states to solve. Let's rewind the clock and review the history and the evolution of what we have just defined as the world order from immediately after the end of World War II. On this chart, you see many polars or many polar bears. It is not what it looks like. Polarity essentially describes the relative distribution of military and economic power among states in the global system, providing a conceptual map to identify who are the great powers. It was simple during the Cold War period between 1946 and 1990. The great powers were two in what was defined as a bipolar world, the United States, a free market capitalist economy and democratic republic, leading what was defined as the free world, the free Western world, opposite the Soviet Union, a communist autocratic regime with its own sphere of influence, especially in Eastern and Central Europe, and also in South Central Asia, and to a lesser degree in Latin America. West versus East. All other countries were compelled to align with either the East or West, with only few headed by India, formed an unaligned but somewhat powerless bloc. 
After the fall of the Soviet Union, for all intents and purposes, the United States became the sole hegemonic great power in what can best be described as a unipolar world. But after the so-called election of Xi Jinping in 2013 and the spectacular economic growth of the PRC that ensued, by 2015, China rightly claimed its great power status, while Putin's Russia, despite its questionable economic and diplomatic credentials, claimed a seat at the great powers table mainly on the strength of the USSR legacy veto power in the United Nations Security Council. This era between 2015 and 2022 was defined as a tripolar world order. However, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the quagmire war of attrition, Russia has been marginalized and is best known in the circles of political punditry as China's junior partner. The world today is pretty much back to a bipolar world order with great power competition between China and the United States. But will it stay like this? All indications are that the world order is evolving rapidly toward multipolarity as a result of the rise of middle power nations individually like India or collectively like the African Union, the European Union, and even the potential for a Middle East Union if normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia were to successfully be brokered, that would be such a breakthrough in the Middle East. What do we mean by multipolarity or a multipolar world? The United States and China appears to be opening diplomatic and economic opportunities for entrepreneurial actors across the world stage. In a historical echo of the non-alignment movement of the first Cold War a half a century ago. For instance, Macron pronouncing that Europe should become a third pole on the world stage and raising doubts about following America's lead on Ukraine and Taiwan. The global leader who has most theatrically flouted American leadership is President Luis Inacio Lula da Silva in Brazil. India's Narendra Modi negotiating green energy agreements, tech transfers, and weapons deals with the European Union. Refusal across the developing world to take a side in the Ukraine conflict is further indication of the independence rather than the following of uh, great powers policies. There has been a striking turn in global opinion against the United States in the past decade with the invasion of Ukraine only slightly denting the otherwise steady trajectory. You may have heard me before say that I'm a fan of Farid Zakaria's GPS program on CNN, Sundays at 10 and one o'clock. Frankly, I believe that this is the most uh, informative, insightful global affairs program available on mainstream media. And so I'd like you to listen to Farid Zakaria's take on that phenomena of the world becoming more of a multipolarity world with the rise of middle power and the disenchantment with the United States. This is something that has started, frankly, during the Trump administration, when Trump waved the flag of America first and other countries began to worry whether they could trust the United States as a reliable ally. As I was following Turkey's recent general election, 
I was stunned to hear one of the country's top officials, then Interior Minister Soleiman Soylu, speaking to a crowd from a balcony. Jubilant, he promised that Erdogan would wipe away whoever causes trouble for Turkey, and that includes the American military. He declared earlier that those who pursue a pro-American approach will be considered traitors. Keep in mind that Turkey has been a member of NATO with American military bases in the country for about 70 years. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan often uses strident anti-Western rhetoric himself. Before the election's first round, Erdogan tweeted that his opponent won't say what he promised to the baby-killing terrorists or to the Western countries. Erdogan may be one of the most extreme representatives of this attitude, but he is not alone. As many commentators have noted, most of the world's population is not aligned with the West in its struggle against Putin's invasion of Ukraine. And the Ukraine war itself has only highlighted a broader phenomenon. Many of the world's largest and most powerful countries in the developing world are growing increasingly anti-Western and anti-American. When Brazil elected Luiz Ignacio Lula da Silva to the presidency last October, many heaved a sigh of relief that the mercurial populist Jair Bolsonaro had been replaced by a traditional and familiar left-of-center figure. Yet Lula has chosen to pointedly criticize the West, rage against the hegemony of the dollar, and claim that Russia and Ukraine are equally to blame for the war. This week, he hosted Venezuela's President Nicolas Maduro, whose brutal reign has led millions to flee his country. Lula lavished praise on the dictator and criticized Washington for denying Maduro's legitimacy and imposing sanctions on him. South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa had a reputation as a practical, business-friendly moderate who has strong ties with the West. But South Africa under him has veered closer into the Russian and Chinese orbit. The country has refused to condemn the Russian invasion of Ukraine, has hosted the Russian and Chinese navies for joint exercises, and now stands accused by the United States of supplying arms to Russia, allegations that South Africa has denied. And then there is India, which has made clear from the start of the Ukraine war that it had no intention of siding against Russia, which remains the chief supplier of advanced weaponry for the Indian military. Indian statements about their desire to maintain a balance in their relations between the West and Russia and even China have been so numerous that Ashley Tellis, one of the most respected scholars on U.S.-India relations, wrote an essay warning Washington not to assume that New Delhi would side with it in any future crisis with Beijing. What is going on? Why is the United States having so much trouble with so many of the world's largest developing nations? These attitudes are rooted in a phenomenon that I described in 2008 as the rise of the rest. Over the last two decades, a huge shift in the international system has taken place. Countries that were once populous but poor have moved from the margins to center stage. Once comprising a negligible share of the global economy, the so-called emerging markets now make up fully half of it. It would be fair to say they have emerged. As these countries have become economically strong, politically stable, and culturally proud, they have become more nationalist. And their nationalism is often defined in opposition to those countries that dominate the international system, meaning the West. Many of these nations were once colonized by Western nations, and so they retain an instinctive aversion to Western so where does the power of the mid-power states come from? Middle power today have more agency than at any time since World War II. These are countries with significant leverage in geopolitics, but they are less powerful than the world's two superpowers, the United States and China. In the global north, they include France, Germany, Japan, Russia, South Korea, and others. With the exception of Russia, these countries do not tell us much about the shifting dynamics of power and leverage, as they remain broadly aligned with the United States. 
However, much more interesting are the six leading middle powers of the global south, Brazil, India, Indonesia, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, and Turkey. These swing states of the global south are not fully aligned with either superpower and are therefore free to create new power dynamics. All are members of the G20 and active in both geopolitics and geoeconomics. These six also serve as a good barometer for broader geopolitical trends in the global south. This brings up an even more interesting question. Are the oil-rich Gulf states also moving away from the United States? Today, our top story is about the Gulf nations. Now, this part of West Asia has traditionally been a staunch ally of the United States of America. But recently, it looks like they're looking after their own self-interest. Now, the United Arab Emirates, Mohammed bin Zayed, has visited Moscow, sat down with the President Vladimir Putin. This and much more changed about the policies of the Gulf nations. We bring you all the details about this in this report. The Gulf nations have traditionally been staunch allies of the U.S. Who do we mean when we say Gulf nations? We're talking about Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Qatar, and Kuwait. All of these West Asian nations are oil producers. They are part of the OPEC group. The U.S. has a large military presence in the Gulf. That is because of a security for oil agreement between the U.S. and the Gulf states. This tie-up is most visible in Saudi Arabia, the largest oil producer. And why does the U.S. have such an arrangement? Well, to secure its oil interests. But what about the interests of the oil producers? Do they always align with U.S. needs? What happens when they don't? We are seeing that very scenario play out. As you know, earlier this month, the OPEC Plus group met in Vienna. OPEC Plus is the alliance of oil producers and other nations, including Russia. After the meeting, the group decided to cut oil production. That went directly against the wishes of the U.S. The U.S. reaction was expected. Washington was furious. There were talks about stopping arms supplies to Riyadh. The U.S. even released part of its strategic oil reserves on Wednesday. Today I'm announcing three critical steps that my administration will take to reduce gas prices at the pump. First, the Department of Energy will release another 15 million barrels from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, extending our previously announced release through the month of December. This is because the Democratic Party needs fuel prices to go down. They are facing the midterm elections in a few weeks. They can't afford to anger the public with high fuel costs. Having known this, why did Gulf nations not keep production stable? Or why did they not at least wait for the elections to end? The Gulf nations have said the decision was not political. The last decision was taken on the same approach. And I would like to reiterate that there is nothing political about any decision we take within OPEC. Let's take a look at some of the recent diplomatic moves the Gulf states have made. Just days after the OPEC meeting, the UAE's President Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed met Russian President Vladimir Putin in St. Petersburg. He became one of the small number of world leaders to visit Russia since the invasion of Ukraine. Days later, Putin met with Qatar's Emir Tamim bin Hamad in Kazakhstan. They held a face-to-face -face meeting on the sidelines of the CICA summit. Talks about Ukraine, trade and investment were on the agenda. They also discussed the upcoming football World Cup in Qatar. I would like to thank you, Mr. President. The success that Russia had during the 2018 World Cup is a big help in preparing for the World Cup that we will be hosting. We thank you for your cooperation in preparing for the upcoming tournament. 
These meetings, combined with the oil cuts, what does it mean? Are the Gulf states realigning towards Russia? Not necessarily. While the moves are sure to have angered the US, they could just be acts of self-interest by the Gulf nations. US-Saudi Arabia ties have been cold since Joe Biden became president. Remember, Biden had promised to make the kingdom a pariah in the run-up to his election. He said he would hold Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman to account for the murder of Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Perhaps the Gulf nations are not realigning away from the US, but from the Democratic Party. Saudi Arabia did share good ties with former President Donald Trump, after all. For now, the US seems to be evaluating its relations with its Gulf allies. Oil may be of primary importance, but that's not the only US interest in West Asia. As shown in this chart that superpowers, even great empires, come and go. What is interesting that the process of declining power extends to one or two decades. It happened to the Dutch, the British, and if to predict the United States still has plenty of fuel in the tank, but it is gradually dwindling with protectionist policies. All the while, up until recently, mind you, with the decline of the Chinese economy of late, China is on the ascend and its longevity appears secure for a longer period of time. Russia's war against Ukraine will have consequences extending far beyond the European Union and the US security and defense policies. In fact, this war is the most visible and tragic proof to date that the world is in a dramatic process of change. The old order forged by the momentous events of two world wars originating in Germany and Europe and designed first and foremost by the United States of America is losing its power to shape global events. The Wilsonian era began at the time when China, India, and the African nations were still referred to as third world countries and looked down upon by the paternalistic old European powers and of course by the United States. A new world order is emerging, a new axis of world powers with common grievances and one common enemy. No prizes for guessing which one, the United States of America, a country which has for decades tried to shape our world in its image and established its preeminence in almost every facet of power, be it military, economy, technology, culture or morality for that matter. It is America the world looks up to all thanks to its global influence networks and of course, the American PR machinery. But what if I tell you that things are changing? That America's global empire is crumbling, the hegemony of Western nations is dying. And a new alliance is looking to replace it, an alliance led by three countries, Russia, China, and Iran. The three most sanctioned countries in the world. They seem to have formed a rather informal alliance of convenience a loose alliance of sorts which the West is calling a troika of tyranny and a triad of bullies. What have they done to deserve such titles and can they really reshape the prevailing world order? Or will they instead push the world into further disorder? And above everything else, where does India fit in this new axis? Does it have any reason to worry? We'll find out over the next few minutes. Hello and welcome to Gravitas Plus. My name is Priyanka Sharma. A new global alliance is now in the making, an alliance between China, Iran, and Moscow. They're forging their strategic, defense, and economic ties. It doesn't take a genius to notice the pattern. Just look at some recent developments. Ever since Russia invaded Ukraine, the three countries have come closer. Yes, China is uncomfortable with the war. 
but it still provides Russia with a diplomatic umbrella. It is also helping Moscow economically by rejecting the G7's price caps on oil. The same case with Iran. It is still buying Russian oil and sending weapons in return. Yes, for the last one year, Tehran has sent countless kamikaze drones. And if reports are to be believed, it might just send ballistic missiles by this October. These deals are being accompanied by state visits. Leaders and officials from all three countries have been frequently flying to each other's capitals. In July last year, the Russian president went to Tehran. He met his counterpart, Ibrahim Raisi, and discussed strengthening bilateral ties. Contrary to expectations, Iran didn't downplay this visit. In fact, it rolled out a red carpet for Vladimir Putin. The Iranian oil minister personally went to greet Putin. And then in November, a group of Russian security officials visited Iran. Their aim was to find ways to counter Western pressure on both countries. Syria is another good example. Another good example of the Iranian and Russian interests coming together. For years now, both sides have been trying to keep Bashar al-Assad in power. Their only aim is to counter American interests in Syria. Just last week, the U.S. shot down Iranian-made spy drones in Syria. And if we speak of Russia, despite being militarily involved in Ukraine, Russia still maintains a military presence in Syria, an indication that it's not leaving the country anytime soon. And if we speak of Russian and Iranian cooperation in Syria, it's a tale that gets murkier. The deeper you dig, Russia continues to provide a decisive cover to Syrian and Iranian-backed ground forces in Syria. And then, of course, we have China. Chinese President Xi Jinping and Russia's Putin recently caught up over a phone call. This was around New Year's Eve. The two sides released statements saying the ties are at their historic best. What's more, Putin said he's expecting a state visit from Xi Jinping soon. We are expecting you, dear friend, was the message from Moscow. We are hardly surprised. The entire world knows about China's bonhomie with Russia and we'll focus on China's love affair with Iran. An affair getting intense by the day. You see, in 2021, China and Iran signed a 25-year comprehensive strategic partnership deal, a deal that has given China its deepest ever foothold in Iran. With many Iranians even saying that the deal has literally sold Iran to China. But the Islamic Republic's leadership doesn't see it that way. Why? Because in return, Iran was made a permanent member of the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, a body led by China. It's the largest regional organization in terms of world population, global GDP, and geographic scope. Iran's membership in this body does little for the region it represents, but more for the powers that run it, Russia and China. With Iran on their side, their ambitions of countering the West get greater legitimacy and support. For Iran, this membership helps it battle the economic isolation from the West. So it's a win-win deal of sorts. In December last year, China's vice premier, Hu Xunhua, flew down to Tehran and more recently, Iran's president visited China, Ibrahim Raisi. He was in Beijing from the 14th of February to the 16th. The Chinese president gave him a red carpet welcome, followed by a guard of honor by the Chinese military. The arrangements were grand, to say the least. They had to be. After all, this was the first state visit by an Iranian leader to China in almost two decades, and Raisi didn't go to Beijing alone. He took along a huge entourage of ministers. The biggest Iranian delegation to Beijing ever. This included six members of Raisi's cabinet. In an editorial about the visit, China's mouthpiece, the Global Times, said that the visit was proof that an anti-Western front is growing. Politics now replaces geoeconomics and hierarchies regain dominance over networks. It looks like the next decade will be characterized by various nations vying for influence in a new global order. Power interest will supersede economic strength as the currency of international politics. Globalization is a phenomenon that creates networked economies based on free trade in goods and services, capital mobility, and risk change, knowledge diffusion and information sharing, migration and human capital mobility. These are going to be the factors 
that will determine future alliances. Navigating through this tumultuous period will require careful diplomacy and a sensitive global perspective. It will require striking new balance between confrontation, competition, and cooperation. And at any point in time, all three may be in play. What do we mean by confrontation? Confrontation on the issues of human rights, like Taiwan and the freedom of international maritime traffic, competition on the issues of innovation, economic success and technology, cooperation in global challenges such as the battle against COVID-19, climate change and the control of nuclear weapons. The world will not wait for Europe, even if it is the only place where a modern world works. Minority resistant democracy, a society capable of integration and an innovative transformative market economy, that would be the prescription for nations to succeed. It is a club of unpredictable democracies. Although the rise of the middle power is only number nine in the list of the 10 global topics and trends in 2023, as you see here on the list, it is likely the most sustainable one over a longer period of time that will affect world order in the decades to come. What do we mean by a middle power? What is the middle power theory? In international relations, a middle power is a sovereign state that is not a great power, nor a superpower, but still has large or moderate influence and in international recognition. Who are the middle power countries? We talked about it in Europe, Belgium, the Netherlands, in Poland, in the Americas, Argentina, Brazil, Canada, and Mexico, in the Pacific, Australia, and India, in Africa, South Africa, and Nigeria, in the Middle East, Israel, and Saudi Arabia. Not all of them are rising at the same time, but some of them do. For example, Indonesia, due to its wealth of critical minerals, Turkey as a negotiator in the Ukrainian conflict or potential negotiator in the Ukrainian conflict. Saudi Arabia with all its oil wealth has become more important amid Russia sanctions. Brazil, a critical player in global climate negotiations. And South Korea due to its diplomatic and growing cultural soft power. So where does uh, middle power strength emerge from? Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine this year brought to an end the post-Cold War reconciliation between Russia and the West. Rivalries between the US and China have increased too as Beijing ramped up its military pressure on Taiwan and Washington tightened controls on technology export to China great power confrontation is back. As Washington, Brussels, Beijing, and Moscow attempt to bend world affairs in their direction, they must pay more attention to the views of those in between, such as Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, and South Africa. And even though this uh, photo is dated, as you can see by the people present, uh, with the exception, I think, of, uh, of course, Trudeau and uh, Macron. Searching for a middle power role in the new world order is going to become part of the agenda of every middle power country. And for that matter, Canada can only be define itself as one of them although 
the proximity to the U.S. both economically and through uh, defense alliances and others, it is not very likely that Canada will emerge as a real player on the world scene for some time to come. So it appears that building alliances or joining alliances, as you see that trend continue, will become part of the political agenda and the foreign policy of many states that heretofore were content to stay within their borders. That is particularly relevant to Latin America. A summit of 12 South American leaders is taking place in Brazil, aimed at reviving cooperation in the region. Brazil's president, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, is hosting the gathering following years of fractious relations between the countries attending the event. The meeting includes Venezuela's Nicolas Maduro. He's visiting Brazil for the first time since it restored relations with Caracas that had been severed by former Brazilian president Jair Bolsonaro. And Maduro's presence in Brazil is a sign of growing acceptance of Venezuela by some countries in the international community. His government is considered to be authoritarian and illegitimate by dozens of countries around the world. In 2020, the U.S. Department of Justice charged the Venezuelan leader and other high-ranking officials with narco-terrorism, corruption and drug trafficking. Now, Maduro aspires to oversee his country joining the BRICS group of leading emerging nations. Brazil's Lula said... He would welcome the move. There are several proposals from other countries that want to join BRICS, and we are going to discuss it because it does not depend on Brazil's will. It depends on everyone's will. We will discuss it if there is an official request. This request will officially be taken to BRICS, and we will decide there. If you ask me, what do I think? I'm in favor of it. For his part, Maduro said membership of BRICS for Venezuela would contribute to a new multipolar world order. We need to build a new geopolitical order with fundamental components. One of them is the Union of South America with our diversities. And together with BRICS, we have seen in the geopolitical sphere an element where we can advance in the union of these five very powerful countries. Let's dig deeper and bring in Ivo Hernandez from the University of Münster in northern Germany. He is a political scientist from Venezuela. Mr. Hernandez, good to see you. Why exactly is Lula rolling out the red carpet for a man who just months ago was banned from even entering Brazil? Well, there are many reasons to that. Uh, mainly, I think Lula is reissuing his former foreign policy, the way he used to do it when he was in power a couple of, of years ago. Actually, we see that UNASUR, as he's trying to uh, inaugurate now, is this old organization founded in 2008. And he's bringing Nicolás Maduro, who was or who is the heir of uh, former Lieutenant Colonel Chávez, at that time the president of Venezuela, who inaugurated with him UNASUR. So we see all this uh, display of sort of like a new diplomacy that has old roots, somehow to speak. Mm -hmm. Well, let's take a look at some uh, examples of uh, really emerging players with a lot more weight behind them than others who want to be. So here are some cases. The Ukraine war, for instance, has given Ankara, Turkey, real leverage. Turks brokered the deal to allow grain to be transported across the Black Sea, easing food price inflation across the world. Turkey may yet play a significant role in future peace negotiations. The Ukraine war have also increased Saudi leverage. Joe Biden once talked of turning the country into a pariah, but he paid respectful visit to Riyadh over the summer. In recent weeks, the Saudis have hosted Xi Jinping, China's leader. India, of course, has a realistic aspiration to become one of the world's superpowers uh, during this century. 
It's also charting the middle path. It has outraged some in the West by importing cheap Russian oil, but media knows it can get away with this, as it is also crucial to Western effort to balance Chinese power. But like in any new foreign policy trend, this must also come with a warning. States must be careful to keep their house clean and not to overplay their hand. And guess what? This trend may well be a sign of a return to democracy. In the post-Cold War era, a number of middle powers rose to prominence thanks to domestic reforms and a favorable international environment of economic and political globalization. These countries began to pursue middle power foreign policies, working actively in international organization, engaging in areas such as uh, conflict mediation, humanitarian assistance, and the promotion of human rights and helping to diffuse democracy and market reforms in the neighborhoods. In this way, they contributed to the stability and expansion of the liberal international order in the post-Cold War period. Nonetheless, recent democratic and economic backsliding in their middle powers raises concerns. Focusing on the cases of Turkey and Mexico, this article explores how reversal in democratic and market reform exasperates or exasperated by recent trends toward deglobalization influence emerging middle powers foreign policies and their political contribution to the liberal international order. I agree that whereas their rise had helped reinforce and expand the liberal international order, emerging middle powers illiberal turn may have destabilizing effect on this order. One of the most uh, stable, democratic, economically sound of all the middle powers is likely South Korea. And South Korea earned the credibility now to conduct foreign policy from a position of strength, as you'll see here in the next video. The South Korean leader's first ever summit with leaders of the Pacific Islands, as well as his back-to-back -back bilateral meetings, carries significance in that the nation is expanding its role in the Indo-Pacific, according to experts. Our presidential correspondent, Woo Soo-young, files this report. South Korea is stepping up as a stabilizing force for peace and development, establishing stronger relations with Pacific Island countries amid compounding threats to a free and rules-based order in the region. Alongside Seoul's first ever multilateral summit with all 18 leaders of the Pacific Island Forum nations, President Yoon seok yeol held separate meetings with 10 heads of government. Their talks focused on climate, healthcare, infrastructure and development assistance as key areas of cooperation, as extreme climate events threaten the health of Pacific Islanders and their economic and social development. Yoon's engagement with the islands is in line with this Indo-Pacific strategy. I think it reflects a more values-based agenda that the Union administration is trying to pursue um, to preserve a free and open regional order, and such as hosting the Summit for Democracy this year, and now with the Pacific Islands leaders visiting Korea for the first time. It's to show that Korea can step up and play a more active role in providing regional public goods. Preserving a free and liberal order in the region and protecting maritime routes is vital to Seoul's national and economic security interests as it seeks multilateral efforts to deter a nuclear North Korea and bolster trade relations as a heavily export-dependent nation. This calls for more expansive partnerships.
The Pacific Island nations are obviously very strategically important, both geographically and in the context of their um, representation in the United Nations. It appears for the first time in years that reconciliation already between Saudi Arabia and Iran, a breakthrough, and likely soon between Israel and Saudi Arabia, even more of a breakthrough, will bring a lasting change to the region. Considering how fast-paced the tech industry is booming, have you ever wondered what 2030 would look like in the Middle East? Today, we welcome you to join us on a virtual tour of how the Middle East is evolving with some of the world's best technology. Number five, Neom City, Saudi Arabia. Neom airs to be the future of livability. The project calls for the construction of a 26,500 square kilometer worth of industrial development. The name Neom is derived from two words. The first three letters from the ancient Greek pre prefix neo meaning new the fourth letter is from the abbreviation of mastakbal an arabic word meaning future the high-tech business city which is true to its name by all means stretches across the borders of northwest saudi arabia and further into jordan and egypt the city will include nine specialized investment sectors which include energy and water mobility biotech food technological and digital sciences, advanced manufacturing, media, and entertainment. It is likely that robots may outnumber humans in this pioneering city, which is deemed to be a new blueprint for sustainable life. The massive project would be entirely powered by renewable energy and served by driverless vehicles and vertical farms. Number four, Hale and Gasha Sour Gas Development, Abu Dhabi. The project calls for the development of Hale and Gasha Sour Gas Fields in Abu Dhabi, which aims at producing one billion of sour gas per day. The project is one of the largest sour gas fields and most significant upstream project that ADNOC is developing. The infrastructure requirements for the expansive project include a minimum of 11 offshore artificial islands to be exclusively designed and constructed from scratch. The project is currently in the feed stage. Normalization of political and economic relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia that the United States are attempting vigorously to broker may become a reality soon and will represent the most significant development in the Middle East for the past 100 years. It will end the Arab-Israeli war once and for all and likely will ease the road to a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The four parties that can make it happen want and need and need it now for their own strategic interest domestically, which is always a good sign for success. Saudi Arabia needs U.S. security agreement uh, they want to purchase F-35s from the United States, over which Israel has a veto power. They need Israel technology to advance their Vision 2030 to modernize the economy and the society of Saudi Arabia. The U.S.-Israel-Saudi Arabia normalization is key achievement for the Biden administration, especially going into a campaign mode for re-election in 2024, and also to demonstrate that the U.S. has not abandoned the Middle East, particularly after China had managed to broker a normalization between Iran and Saudi Arabia, almost behind the United States' back, so to speak. Israel, uh, the Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, needs it badly for many, many reasons. Uh, one of them is believing that he will be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, which has been something he always craved for his legacy. But uh, more importantly, uh, that would bring the Israeli people together 
potentially in a unity government and uh, will resolve somehow the domestic chaos that is taking place in Israel right now. The Palestinians, the Palestinians recognize that they cannot stand in the way of something like this to happen. The momentum is too much. And while they may not get uh, the uh, demands that they made in uh, 1948 or in 1967 or in 1973, uh, they recognize that at the very least, uh, Saudi Arabia uh, and Israel working together will improve their economic situation. Saudi Arabia is willing to invest uh, a lot of money in the development and an infrastructure in the Palestinian uh, area. And so that could be a real breakthrough. And then uh, there's BRICS and BRICS is uprising again after being dormant more or less for uh, a period of time. BRICS, the affiliation of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa has been an oddball in the geopolitical map for a period of time, but is now strengthening. And as of the last meeting of the BRICS, offered an invitation to other countries to join. And guess what? BRICS now has a real dilemma. After the last meeting with extended invitations to other countries to join the organization, they may have to change their acronym and I don't see how they could possibly do it. With the addition of Saudi Arabia, Iran, Egypt, the United Arab Emirates, Ethiopia, and Argentina have now joined the organization, continuing the trend of states trying to enter into larger groups in order to lend themselves more influence and power in deciding things that affect the world order. And do not discount Africa. Africa as a continent is coming together under the umbrella of the Africa Union. And there's a question why Africa is becoming a bigger player in the global economy. And this article is part of a series examining Africa in transition. For more than a century, foreign direct investment in Africa was almost exclusively focused on the extraction and export of natural resources of course, during the colonization period. But since the turn of the millennium, the momentum has shifted. And in the past few years, the trend has finally flipped. Global investors now come to Africa more often for the promise of its people than for its physical properties. आगे की कार्यवाही शुरू करने से पहले मैं अफ्रीकन यूनियन के अध्यक्ष को G20 के स्थायी सदस्य के रूप में अपना स्थान ग्रहण करने के लिए that you will have such forums for international economic cooperation um, running at the, with the exclusion of large parts of the world. Now we are moving towards a direction that includes those parts of the world that were excluded. We share a lot of common challenges, particularly with respect to um, climate change. And, and those issues cannot be resolved um, through you know, exclusive approaches. They have to be um, inclusive, uh, they have to include those affected and those that bear the most responsibility 
in um, guiding the world through these challenges. It's an important development um, to have the African continent included um, in such uh, forums and, and processes. And we see it as, as, as an important step that signals more reform processes that we would like to see with respect to the United Nations Security Council, with respect to um, your global multilateral uh, uh, financial institutions. आगे की कार्रवाई शुरू करने से पहले मैं अफ्रीकन यूनियन के अध्यक्ष को G20 के स्थायी सदस्य के रूप में अपना स्थान ग्रहण करने के लिए that you will have such forums for international economic cooperation um, running at the, with the exclusion of large parts of the world. And now we are moving towards... The West cannot afford to ignore the middle powers that are represented at the G20. Their growing economic heft means they are crucial to shaping the rules of trade, technology, sanctions, and international norms. It would be a mistake to give up on influencing the middle powers of the global south. But unchecked aggression by Russia and China would eventually also threaten the interest of middle powers, such as Turkey, Indonesia, India, and the Gulf states. That too, is a lesson that needs to be absorbed.